affairs or issues that have been so elusive to let me speak from a Christian perspective Dr. Masanga, you know in the Bible, there is, you remember a woman who gave 10 cents and Jesus said, you are the person who has given it most. You know why? Because from my own perspective, the generosity of a person is not how much he gives, but how much he retains. You, Dr. Masanga, and you, Professor Remumba, you have retained nothing. If Jesus could be around, he could say, you are the people who have given most on African affairs. To that extent, I'm deeply indebted to your service. Please allow me quickly to dig a little in on the issues which Professor brought in the morning. And he posed a question, who's responsible for a problem in Africa? Is it other people like the Western world or African themselves? Please let me put this in perspective by quoting one of the top American presidents, Dr. Henry David Tolle. He said that if a man walks or advances confidently in the direction of his dreams and endeavors to live the life which he has imagined, he will meet with success unexpected in common hours. Listeners and participants and the fellow panelists, if you put into context that statement, three verbs come into light. Advance, first of all. How confidently? To where in the direction of the dream African nations since they got independence? Did they know which direction they were advancing to? I don't think so. That could be the genesis of the problems we face to date. Professor Limumba, I could answer the question by saying, it is not only leaders who are responsible, also followers or citizens of Africa. Why? Because, Prof, there was one of the German leaders called Stalin. He took a chicken or a hen and removed all the fetters with the force. And the hen started to bleed profusely and threw it on the floor. And Stalin removed some, some wheat and threw it on the floor and the chicken started following Stalin after injuring it. Then Stalin turned to his followers and they said, like that hen which I have inflicted pain, that is how stupid followers would follow me even if they have been inflicted pain so long as there is some tokenism. So Professor, as much as the leaders have taken us backwards, what about the citizens who follow them? They are like the chicken which is Stalin inflicted pain, but when he showed some wheat to it, it still started to follow him. What am I saying, my fellow panelists and listeners, from wherever you are, what I'm saying is this. We have three parties here. Those with interests who want to come to Africa, we call them the Western world. Them, they want the interests. They are the people we have elected who become conspirators to them. They conspire. We, the citizens who elected the African leaders, we expected them to serve us as their master. 
or did they decide to serve several masters? Who are they? The Western world. Who's the second master? Their ego. And who's the last master? Us. That is why we say, whoever serves and one master will cheat others. So these leaders conspire to serve only their egos and the others, and they leave Africa bleeding. Professor Dr. Masanga, please, that is why I took the first opportunity to congratulate you for the work you are doing. Dr. Masanga, please allow me to project one of the top African proverb, which says, if there is no enemy within, the enemy outside will do you no harm. What is the enemy within? African leaders and their followers. They have let African down. Africa has a lot of resources. I usually tell when I get opportunity to train, because I'm a leadership trainer, what Africa lacks is not resources. Africa lacks resourcefulness. Africa lacks resourcefulness. There are a lot of resources in Africa. We're not intelligent enough to convert those resources into marketable products so that you get value for your people. That's why you travel across the continent Poverty will sink your heart. We who are listening to this conference today, this is a Damascus moment. Why? Even Saul changed to Paul, and they finally say, when he became Paul, the things I used to hate, I love. The things I used to love, I hate. I look forward, Dr. Masanga, that moment. When the African leaders who are listening us today and their followers will realize a moment and go through the forces where Saul went through until he became Paul. Remember, Paul even wrote 50% of the books in the Bible, both in the New and the Old Testament. But he hated the Christians. Let us not lose hope, friends. And I want to say here, before I conclude, there's one poet I love, the English poet, John Donne. He one time said, no, no man is an island, entire on itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. The death of any man diminishes me because I'm involved in mankind and never send to know for whom the tale tolls. It tolls for thee. African leaders, African citizens, the pale is tolling on us. It's tolling on us. And before it tolls on us, friends, African leaders, African citizens, before the pale tolls on us, let it be our wake-up call. Let us work up transform Africa. Doc, Professor Mumba, you highlighted how even intellectuals themselves have fallen in trap to serve the foreign master. Professor, you, 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 you touched my inner soul because in African continent, we have produced charismatic leaders without character, gifted leaders without conviction, powerful leaders without principles. You see how they change parties. Direct your leaders without morality. Visionary leaders without values. Spiritual leaders without conscience. In fact, the prof, if there is any category of these leaders who have impoverished Africa, it's the last category, the religious leaders. I'm not talking about the Christian or Muslims. I'm talking about the religious. It's a negative word. Karl Marx said, poverty, the region, sorry, is the, op is the opium for the poor. 
That is where you see all of these elite political leaders go to church through that forum, the Imbophorized Africa. Africa, instead of producing the true fire to meld metals, to make equipment, you hear people yelling fire, fire from spiritual evangelists who are con men. Fire, which is an abstract form, when the other Western world produced the real fire to lead the world. Oh my God, may these spiritual leaders get the divine revelation. Otherwise, Africa will perish. I wish to end by, please, if you allow me, Dr. Masanga, from one of the anonymous pieces. I don't know who wrote it. He said that when I was young, I dreamed of changing the world. But when I grew old and wiser, I discovered the world could not change. So I shortened my sights and only wanted to change my country. But it was immovable. In my twilight years, on my last desperate attempt, I settled on changing my family, those closest to me, but none of it could hear of it. As I laid on my dead bed, I realized that if I could have changed myself, by example, I could have changed my family. And my family, through inspiration and enthusiasm, could have changed the next community, and the next community could have changed the other communities. Maybe the communities could have changed the country. Maybe the country could have changed, the world could have changed. Dr. Masanga, I conclude, African leaders listening to us today, this forum, this Damascus moment, you, Professor Mumba, I had several speakers sending you, can you go and speak to the leaders? Because a man of your stature, you have a forum. Take them this message, a resolution we are making from this conference. It may not be absolute, but it can be inferred. I want to tell you, friends, let this continue. In most of the time, because some people have to hear seven times before they ask, what are you saying? Are African leaders listening? I hope so. And those professionals who should change your various nations in a foreign land, where I come from, even if your mother has one eye, you feel that eye as a beauty spot. Even if your country has challenges, don't expose it. Protect it as you protect your mother's one eye as a beauty spot. I hope they are listening. They live in foreign land. Finally, the problem in Africa, we never get planted enough to lick the fruits. My grandmother, an illiterate person, woman, used to tell me the seed must remain planted until the harvest. Look at Africa. Leaders, they change from one party to the other, talk of divorce. These people embarrass us, but today they will hear the message. Thank you very much, the participants. Dr. Masanga, admire you, Doc. Professor Rumumba, I have no word for you. I know you have done enough. Continue doing until you are called to glory and God will reward you. Thank you very much. May God bless you. Dr. Masanga, I submit. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Nakama, for a motivational speaker like the Professor Rumumba. I cannot manage your speed at which you speak. <laughs> but I can manage to pick several things that you bring out. 
I like Dr. Joseph Nachama for telling us how Emperor Nero called for fire. Every time Emperor Nero stood up, said, I will fire you, fire you, fire you. Guess what happened? Fire came and took down Rome. <laughs> so, the message you have passed on today is we shall not keep quiet. We shall spread the fire until it reaches where it's supposed to be. Africa does not lack resources. Africa lacks resourcefulness. That's the message I got from Dr. Nachama. Where else can you get such brains coming to this castle like Dr. Hamida, who left us with something, a revelation from Khartoum, militias have surrounded them. So what do we expect? Because we are talking about security in this conference. These militias are not Europeans. <laughs> they are self-made, as the professor said. We created the problems ourselves. But as I speak, now good things always come to an end. And we in the final kicking moment of our conference. I want to take this opportunity to tell you that before I call upon the next three speakers, that will be Professor Lumumba, Simon Ekepa, and another gentleman from Mozambique who should be coming. His Excellency President, or he has sent a representative, as he said. I want to take this opportunity to bring one lady who just have three minutes. That lady is Anne, who is already ready. Anne Kabureke. Thank you very much, Madam, for joining us late. But the podium is yours. I believe my research has already done some research on, on who you are. But you will briefly introduce yourself, and you are always, all the time, welcome. Be brief. You have only three minutes. Thank you. And I will not go and sit down. I will watch from here. Thank you. Your time starts now, Anne. Okay. Um, sorry. Sorry, you can hear me well now? Yes. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Matsanga. My name is Anne Karambu. Uh, you mentioned uh, my name wrongly. That's why I was not able to speak the other time. I am Kenyan. I'm sorry, ma'am, 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 hold on. Hold the fire. The, my PA is the one who misled me. She gave me a wrong name. Uh, Michelle apologized to Madame. I always mention the right names of ladies, please, please. please. I'm sorry, Anne. Hey. It's okay. Hey. Apology accepted. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, I am Anne Karambu. I am a counselor by profession. So I come in in a forum where there are historians. But I have this great passion with uh, young people, so I run uh, I, I, I run an organization called Youth Concern, where we uh, empower young people to uh, to believe in themselves. And and for me, I come in uh, to bring my submissions, maybe on what I've been listening. I've been here since morning, 
I was able to listen to PLO Lumumba. Thank you so much, Professor Lumumba, for that powerful presentation on Africa. Every time you're talking about Africa, I see the passion. I always keep uh, uh, wondering if we do not have people like uh, uh, Matsanga, we did not have people like PLO Lumumba, who would speak for Africa? Because for clearly, we have a challenge, we have a problem. There is something that needs to be done so that we can be able to also rise up and become uh, uh, honorable people uh, so that our photos cannot be spread around the world as, as the people who, who need help, who need to be supported. But there is one thing uh, maybe I wanted to bring forth. Uh, uh, my, my, my point is that if we have to change Africa, then we have to change the mindset of the African. The African hates their skin. The African hates their language. The African hates the culture. The African hates everything about themselves. And that's why even when uh, uh, products are produced by an African, we will not buy the ones that are produced by an African. We will go for those ones that are produced in, uh, and of course you hear somebody saying, I'm wearing an Italian suit. I am wearing a, 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 a dress coming from uh, Italy. I am wearing a, a cloth coming from uh, the US. I am wearing this coming from Europe. So why is it that as Africans, we hate ourselves so much? It is a problem of the mindset. We have to reach a point where we can be able to love ourselves. And for me, this is uh, my emphasis even when I'm talking to the young people, because when uh, a self-concept of a person has been lost. That person has no value for themselves. And that's why we have universities in our, in our nations in Africa filled with young people. Instead of young people going and doing research in the universities, they are going and, and they, are, they are, are abusing drugs. They, they are getting involved in, in, in sexual immorality. And this is destroying their lives instead of coming out with brains that can be able to change the nation, because we have a problem of self-hatred as a nation, but this, uh, as nations in Africa, but this is a problem of the mind. We, we grew up, uh, I am in the bracket of young people, although I am, I am still uh, uh, beyond the youth, we grew up being shown that the white man is more privileged. The white man is the one ahead of us. And this caused us to hate ourselves. And that's why, uh, of course, we are being controlled on how we dress, how we, uh, we, we put on our hair. We, we even are not comfortable with our, the, our hair. Somebody has told us that when you can have silky hair, that is when you are a true human being. So we have to deal with the issue of self-hatred. We must be able to stop hating ourselves. And this one will only ha happen when we are able to change our mindset. I like what uh, Dr. Yancha uh, uh, said, the one who just spoke before me. He talked about uh, uh, a Damascus uh, moment. It is a time that change is going to happen. And every time change is happening, there must be a change of mind. There must be a change of mindset. We must stop hating ourselves as a people. We must be able to uh, be a people who can be able to embrace our resources. Sometimes we give them away because we don't value them. Sometimes we, uh, we allow the, even the leaders to misuse us because we do not put value to what we have. I see uh, in my country, Kenya, uh, when a leader comes and, and they are using our taxpayers' money to uh, make a road, they will use the very same amount that would be used to make a standard road that can be used for over 20, 30 years. They make a road that will only last for five years because they know in the next five years they will come again and ask for my vote and use my taxpayers' money to be able to uh, again build a road for me. So. What is the challenge? How can we be able to uh, how can we be able to reach this place where we value ourselves? 
because we cannot be able to build Africa when we hate ourselves. We cannot be able to build Africa when we hate ourselves. We must be able to value ourselves. We must teach our children to value Africa. Not when, uh, 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 when uh, a white person passes near us. That I don't know whether that is there in other countries, but where I have grown in Kenya, uh, when a white man passes, is like, I don't know who is that uh, that has passed because every child has to be shown. See, a white person has passed. We must learn to uh, love ourselves. Another challenge is our value systems. What are our values? Our value system has been broken as, an, uh, as Africans. Yes, we dropped the traditional values that we used to have before the colonialists come, came, but we were left a valueless society. And that's why it doesn't matter whether I will kill or whether who it is that I'm going to step upon as long as I get leadership. And that's why somebody is going to be given money that is meant to build a hospital and that person uses that money to buy a VA, which even the people who have produced it themselves don't drive them. We buy our self-worth from material possession. We have, been, we have to be taught to value ourselves, to have value for self and have value for our nation and also value for uh, the resources that God has given us. I am a religious person and I am a believer that we have been placed in this place for a purpose and for a reason and for a season. We will not be here forever. Thank you, Dr. Matsanga and, and, and uh, the likes of uh, uh, Pio Lul Mumba, Professor. You have been a voice in this time. I don't know if your voice was not as loud as it is right now, whether we would even ha be having forums like this. Because uh, for a long time, I see like you've been speaking alone. It's like you've been talking alone. But now you can be sure. We, we have a trail of young people behind you speaking together with you. So it is not a wasted work. We have to, be, to reach this place where we can be able to love ourselves as Africans. That is where we begin. Everything we don't have value for, we will not be able to preserve it. And I believe that's why we have not been able to preserve our nation. That's why we have not been able to reserve our nation. That is why we have not given value even to the resources that we have, because we have not given it any value. Someone said that, uh, and, uh, that is uh, Dr. Miles Monroe. He said anything that whose value is not known shall be abused. We have abused ourselves. We have abused our resources because we do not know its value. We have gold, we have bronze, we have so much minerals in this nation. We have the best climate in the world, all over Africa. How can we be able to use these resources to make Africa better? But it cannot happen until we are able to love ourselves. So to be able to get to this place, where we can be able to even have a conversation about not allowing uh, uh, the West to come and control us, we have to deal with our mindset. The problem is in the mind. I remember Simon in the morning was talking about how Sudan was allowed to remain in, in war for a long time and this affected their mindset. Yes, it affects the mind because what do you tell a child who, are, who was born when uh, there was war until they are 18 years old? They have never seen peace. There is nothing you can tell that child because in their mind, all that they know is war. So we should be able to change our, the mindset and be able to live a, a, a nation or Africa that is uh, guarded by values and also that loves their, themselves and that is able to value the resources that we've been given. I saw like someone had said, I mentioned something about uh, gender equality. Of course, yes, the, pop, the place of a woman in society. Remember, the woman is the one who nurtures children. As much as we would want to give the men the position to rule, if we have marginalized the woman, it means that the man, the, the, the woman who is nurturing the children, will not be able to be empowered 
The woman needs to equally be empowered in a way so that they can be able to raise children who are equally, uh, uh, who value themselves, who have value for themselves and who have high self-worth for who they are. So uh, uh, I'll, I'll, sub I'll leave my submission out to there. Thank you so much. I, I was able to get this from uh, uh, PLO Lumumba's page. That is how I was able to follow this uh, uh, forum and I've really enjoyed the conversation that is here. And yes, we are behind this and we know we can be able to make it, but there must be a mindset change. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne. Thank you, and I want to apologize for having read the name that was on your phone, because the phone reads another name, but I will not make any mistake of that letter again. I now know your name and I follow our page. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all. Unless there is anybody else who wants to say something, the lady from, from Togo, I don't want West Africans to destroy me or to kill me because of not giving them a chance. The lady from West Africa, are you there? She hasn't been able to connect back. We okay, to be a, an exact issue. Thank you very much, Michelle, for the good job, despite the fact that you misled me here. And uh, Madame almost finished me, but thank you very much. Now, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, before PLO, Simon, and our guest, special guest comes in, they have listened. Mine is to tell you one thing, few things. Why did I choose this topic? When I sat down and looked at Africa, what was on my mind when I saw EU deployment in Mozambique? The focus of my paper today, and which was focus of the topic today, which all the aspects have come to capture. We don't have mindset, bad mindset. I agree with the Anne. We have resources, but we're not resourceful. Dangerous and diversity. I agree with Dr. Nyachama and Simon Ekapa. Ekapa. We are makers of our own conflicts. I agree with Professor. Hamida said we don't give the youths. Hamida, prof from Khartoum, we don't give the youth the tools. The analyst will enlarge the tools of analysis for the youth and tell them to focus on looking at the South. There is a problem in Khartoum and Sudan. Several other speakers have spoken. Mine is hammering the point home. The United States of America withdrew from Afghanistan. Now, they are looking for where to dump their hardware. I wanted Africans to understand. When President Chisano was the president of Mozambique, was there a rebellion? Yes, there was a rebellion instigated by Portugal. Portugal, the Portuguese supplying arms to Renamo.
Today, 2021, the conflict in Cape Delgado is not, will not, has no, and will never have an origin from Africa. It is an origin from narcotics. It is an origin from the trade of narcotics in the Indian Ocean. That's my point I want to make home. The empirical data shows that 30 billion dollars or euros are obtained from illicit trade that goes into the economies of Europe. Therefore, someone somewhere is looking for a way of strafing and protecting this route in the Indian Ocean. If I'm wrong, time will tell. Let's look at where Europe has deployed before. Why does the AU, EU, bypass AU to deploy? Some time back, we allowed them to arm the government in Chad in the name of fighting terrorism. The EU was allowed to deploy in the Indian Ocean to curb piracy. And the same companies of in Europe pay ransoms, millions and millions of ransom money, or money paid out of, to secure ships to go from the hands of terrorists or pirates came from the European banks. Can anybody tell me where are we now? We see the European Union going to deploy in Mozambique. Created the Islamists in Cape Delgado. Who are these people fighting in Cape Delgado? Where did they come from? Who is the first person to discover oil and the hot tigers in Cape Delgado and the Beira Triangle? Which country went there first? Just want to find out from the panel and my guests who are coming to give a summary. Who are these total oil? Everywhere you see a conflict in Africa, you see total oil, total oil, total oil. What is going on in Africa? We don't see. The young lady from Khartoum is crying. What is going on? Militias are coming up. Don't be shocked that Total Oil has one group of militia there. The other point I want to make home is the question of the drug market. On this, I want to laud the government of the Republic of Kenya for having done something very significant in the fight against drug and cocaine distribution at the cost 
of the country. President Uru Kenyatta, thank you very much for destroying that ship that taught some people a lesson not to anchor their ships here with drugs in the port of Mombasa, in this city where we are. Thank you, Your Excellency. And if another one comes, hit it. Another one comes, hit it. You received a lot of condemnation at that time, but some of us in our hearts who have lost the people because of drug dealings and cocaine, we are very happy, Mr. President, that you dismantled a cartel that was all the time supplying, equipping logistics of drugs into Kenya. In the countries such as Morocco, Turkey, and the Western Balkans, Professor Lumumba, you realize there is a group of whites who don't speak good English. Where are they coming from? And they, you see, whenever you see them in our hotels, in Nairobi, and then you go out and find out the people they hang out with, you can tell who the enemy is, ourselves. These people know credit card fraud. They know how to take your money from the till without <laughs> your presence. These are from the Balkans, the former Soviet Union Empire. We have seen them very many, especially Ukrainians, specializing in fraudulent activities on the African continent. Who brings them here? Ourselves. Who destroys Kenya and Africa? Ourselves, as Pierre says. We are the problem ourselves. If you look at how conflicts are created on African continent, these groups are linked to ethnicity. A man hires a Turkish national or, or somebody hires like a Buhari hire, has hired so many of these Chinese. Some of them who do that work for against the Afrans. There are many. Presidents in Africa will not hire a black man. <laughs> Have you seen one hiring a black man to do that work? No, they go for people. When you meet them on the street and they want to do something, they don't have any negotiation with you. <laughs> but if you hire a black person, you might tell him, my man, why are you killing me? Leave me alone. Another black man will look at you and say, this, leave this bastard alone. But this guy is mercenary, former generals, former captains, former colonels. In those armies in the central Europe and the Balkans, they are very little. They have brought the crime syndicate. One of the reasons why Britain quit EU is the influx of crime syndicates from the Balkans into the United Kingdom, which has been a step of organization, society, civilized society, where they sort their matter without shooting people. The rate of crime in Britain had risen, and they decided not to do anything with people from European Union. Last thing, I want to say the problems of Africa. Why do we allow EU to deploy 
pay our soldiers. Why is it they, they pay our soldiers and they don't pay themselves when they are the ones selling the same guns? Look at the situation of, Mozam, of Mogadishu, Somalia. EU is ready to pay Ugandan and the Kenyan troops. But it is not ready to put the troops of their own lives. Because they want Africans to fight each other, to meet on the battlefield. This conference also has looked and they should continue to look at working jointly on the recovery of digital innovation in Africa. Climate change in Africa, peace and security in Africa. Bad leadership must stop in Africa, like the leadership of President Buhari. That goes around, that wants to solve a political situation through judicial and other methods. We must start to partnering up as equal partners, not as underdogs, in order to bring Africa and rise it again. With those few words, I want to call upon Simon. I don't know whether he's back. I want to call upon Simon. Yes, I'm here. Now is the time, not more of the speech, it's more of your delivery points, so that we take this resolution from Mombasa and say that's what we want Africa. You have made your points very clear. You see, people who have been listening to you from morning have even taken negative diversity Dangerous diversity. Even professor, professor who was not first of all, you are who did not believe me in me. Your theory, I think, you seem to have got it right. So welcome again in the summary to put to point one, two, three. One of the things I like to you about today is if Nigeria collapses, we shall have a lot of terrorists near our doorsteps. <laughs> My brother, you have not lied. Simon, have you ever, I believe you have ever gone to Dubai? I have never, I have never been to Dubai. Don't go there. <laughs> I will not. <laughs> because if you go there as a Nigerian citizen, as you enter the airport, there is a Nigerian route. Doesn't it shame you? I am not. A, I am not a Nigerian citizen. I have that, not, that's why I, I'm saying. I have not. Uh, yes, I have not had Nigeria passport for decades, so I am okay. not a Nigerian citizen. Thank you, but and uh, please remain that way, <laughs> because it's very embarrassing. To go with an, a gentleman you have sat with in a business class, but he's from this of Nigeria. Then they tell the immigration officer, say the Nigerians that side and the other Africans that side is very. What is the problem? You will tell us today, Simon. Make your closing remarks. And then professor, the other time you answered the professor, today professor will answer you he is here, or he will talk to you. I know you are good friends, you are now one of those. And the professor is a man who speaks up his mind in international theater, talks to these presidents. Some of them are very annoyed with him, like in Zambia. <laughs> 
and other places. They don't want to see his face. And uh, whenever I hear him traveling to these African countries, my heart goes down. And I say, my man, is my professor going to come back? Because some of the things he tells them, a place like my country, Uganda, you go and talk about corruption. And I told him, Mr. A professor that, my friend, which hotel are you staying in? <laughs> and uh, a professor told me, what is the problem? I've just seen you on Uganda TV telling the Ugandans that this type of corruption, this type of staying in power, oh. I said, Prof, where are you staying tonight? Because I have relatives who could have housed him quickly. He said, well, it is that one. And I think Professor used to be a great friend of President Museven. I don't know whether since that statement, President Museven has ever talked to him again. And uh, if he has done, he must be just joking with him. But one day, when he finds you, he will ask you, why did you call me a man who has stayed too much in power? You know what? For me, I don't care staying in power. Because I don't determine when a man should die. I am I'm not against the man removing the time limit because even putting time limit on your life is very dangerous because you are not God. But don't remove time limits on how long you stay in power. Remove time limits on your age. If you have something productive for us to, to look, I have no problem. That's why I said Kotara is now realizing that he needs Babuko. After 10, 10 years in jail, Babuko is very useful for Kotara because he can't hold Bokini Faso anymore. It was going to go to if he had not finished all his prime ministers. Do you not see that all prime ministers in the <laughs> All prime ministers in Cote d'Ivoire have died. They don't survive. One is still on life support. I don't know why they all go. The man wants to remain in power. He doesn't want anybody. That's Cote d'Ivoire. So, Simon, I bring you, give you a few minutes. When you see me walking back here, you receive my paper on the question of EU. I'll come back later, and that was my comment. Narcotics is the problem of Mozambique. We have contributed an article in Africa report, which all of us can read. It is very embarrassing. I don't want to speak about it. It's very embarrassing. Thank you. Now I call upon Simon to take the stand. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Matsanga, for having me again once more. I thank you for having uh, you know, organized this Pan-Africa conference that has been addressing, solving, preferring solution to the problem of Africa. Today, uh, I will not, in this second part of this uh, conference, uh, I will not talk on the same issue I have discussed in the morning. I have come to come from a different context to maintain that the problem everybody have discussed today have one solution. One solution. Our sister who spoke just before Dr. Matsanga 
said a lot of things. She said Africans don't value their own products. Africa don't value themselves. And we that are fighting and shouting for a better Africa, you can see that we are living by example. Look at me. Look at Professor Lumumba. Look at Dr. Matsanga. Our outfit today shows that we are people to listen to. Because we don't just we don't just talk. We lead by example. Pan-Africanists. Look at where I am sitting. I am here in Europe. I am not in Africa. But I value my culture because culture is defined as a way of life of the people. So when we preach Africa, we are preaching from the bottom of our heart. We are preaching because nobody will solve the problem of Africa better than us. We are not preaching this thing because we are politically motivated. We are not coming to this conference trying to create awareness on how to solve Africa problem because we are politically motivated. We are coming because we have Africa at heart. Our actions, our speeches, whatever come from us, body languages are all a demonstration of people who love Africa and want the best for Africa. That is one of the reasons you all must understand that whatever we say, we are doing it for the best interest of Africa. Let me start by saying, for those of you who do not understand why Africa cannot develop their own natural resources, why Africa cannot use the natural resources to produce anything in Africa, even in Nigeria, where you have natural gas, where you have petroleum, where you have all manner of gases there, Nigeria don't have a refinery. Nigeria have to export crude oil, refine crude oil, and they buy the oil again to be used in Nigeria. If that is not stupid, what else is? If that is not absurd, what else is? It is not like they don't know. It is not like they don't know. But because of the diversity in Nigeria, when people who know what to do in government, when people who can revive the refinery want to come to power, the people from other ethnic groups, we never allow them to, to come to power. The people with, from other Fulani and Northern Nigeria who are eradicating innovation and implementing sooner, we never allow any innovative development in Nigeria. That is why people like us are opting out of Nigeria. And it is very, very imperative. If you want a better Africa, you must look at Nigeria. Nigeria is holding Africa down because the biggest potential that will propel a paradigm shift in Africa will come from Nigeria. Biafra and the Dudua and the Middle Belt of Nigeria will be the starting point for a new Africa. Until you realize this, we will continue to come every day and shout. We will continue to give speeches, motivational speaking, and all that. Until you realize that those of you in other African countries must begin to air your voice for people, leaders in your countries, to begin to look in our complaint, to begin to look into why we are opting out of Nigeria, whether it is going to affect you positively or not. 
For those of you who may not understand how diversity has destroyed Africa, including East Africa, where most of you come from today, until recently, several Eastern African countries were riven with political coups, ethnic violence, and oppressive dictators. Since the end of the colonialism, this is your region where you are calling from today has endured all manner of conflict as a result of different diversity, ethnic, ethnic violence, ethnic tensions, ethnic wars that has ravaged Africa it is today. And if you continue to shy away from these challenges of diversity, Africa will never get it right. Let us take example from the northern, northeast Africa. In northeast Africa, you, you, you fought war. The war did not lead to anything, unlike the Europeans. When Europeans, they fight war, they sit back and they think about what led to that war. If Europeans have any national or ethnic or internal conflict, after the conflict, they sit back and check what caused this war. How do we prevent it from coming back or from reoccurring again? Africa don't do that. Africa, they are only good in suppressing those who dare to rise up against injustice. So in a Topia Civil War, from 1974 to 1991, Ethiopia fought civil war. The question is that, was that the cause of that civil war resolved? How has it impacted the Ethiopian economy, the region, and the development of Africa today? In the Eritrea War of Independence between 1961 and 1991, what led to Eritrea war? Has that issue been addressed? Has this been solved? Don't Eritrea have independence today? Are Ethiopia not on their own? Are Eritrea, did, didn't Eritrea uh, separate from Ethiopia? Because of the war, because of independence, because of that between Ethiopians and Eritrea, it led to war. What was the solution? Was it as a result of independence? That led to also Eritrean Ethiopia War. Eritrean Ethiopia War started in 1998 and ended in what led to that war? Diversity. Diversity. The same thing happened to the Ogaden War. The Ogaden War from 19. 1977 to 1970. What led to the Ogaden War? Ethnic differences, diversity. The same thing happened in the Debotian Civil War. The Debotian Civil War was between 1991 and 1994. What led to that war? Diversity. I want you to understand from the context I'm coming from. What diverse, how diversity has destroyed Africa. And there is need for us, the modern age, the modern age, new generation of Africans to tell the older generation that we have found a solution to Africa problem. We need to begin to solve this problem. The same thing happened to the Somali war. The Somali war between 1991 and 2009. What led to the Somali war? The same diversity. If the diversity were disintegrated on time, Somali will not be go to war and fight that war for that decade. Coming to South Sudan, which I pointed out in the morning, the South Sudan war between 1983 till 2005, what led to Sudan, South Sudan war? because the Second Sudan War, because of diversity. Had it been the diversity in Sudan we are addressed as far back as 1983, you would not have the situation you have today in Sudan. 
The question is, how long do we continue to pretend that there is something coming out from diversity? The internal political ethnic conflicts in Sudan as well, from 2011 and it is still ongoing. What led to this conflict? The same diversity. Ethnic conflict. South Sudan civil war started from 2013 to 2015. For us not to have a repeat of this conflict, this wars, we must begin to address the internal problem of Africa, which is dangerous diversities, not just in Nigeria. We've seen it in South, in Southern East Africa. We've seen it in Burundi, in Burundi Civil War. The Burundi Civil War was from 1993 to, 19, to 2005. And the genocide of the Hutus, in 1972 and the genocide of the churches in 1993. These are ethnic, ethnic motivated war. Diversity. Uganda and Tanzania war. What led to it? Diversity. Differences. The Uganda Bush war. What led to it? Diversity. That war lasted from 1981 to 1986. What about the Lord Resistance Army, the insurgency army in Uganda, South Sudan, and the Republic, Democratic Republic of Congo? That war is still ongoing. What led to that war is diversity, ethnic differences. Until we recognize the damage we have, Africa found ourselves trying to harness or trying to benefit something that is not there from our diversity until we begin to address this diversity, begin to disintegrate them. We can never get it right. Rwanda Civil War is still very fresh in our memory. The Rwanda Civil War started in 1990 and ended in 1993. The ravage of that war, the effect of Rwanda War can never be wiped out on the surface of the earth. And the Rwanda genocide against the Tutsi can never be forgotten. What motivated it? Diversity. We have the Zambiza, the, 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 the Zanzibar uh, uh, revolution. The Zanzibar revolution was, if I'm not mistaken, in, uh, uh, 19, in 1964. All these things have made Africa what it is today. Wounds from wars are not easily healed. The only thing that could heal, or the only thing that can heal the wound from war is to solve the reason for the war in the first place. Is to solve the reason, profound solution to why do these people went to war. Biafra war is another example. Biafra war between 1967 to 1970. The wound from Biafra war can never be healed until Biafra is restored as a nation. How do you address them in Nigeria? We have seen injustice, marginalization from Nigeria government, which has facilitated the upsurge in the current agitation for Biafra freedom. What caused the Biafra war? Diversity. Let us now go to First, first Congo war. The first Congo war between 1996 and 1997. And the second Congo war from 1998 to 2003. What led to, what left to that conflict? It is still the same diversity. My people watching me today from Mozambique to Kenya to Tanzania to the entire Africa, watching me today, the time has come where we are going to tell the oldest, the old leaders that we have found solution to Africa problem. It is not enough 
that we continue to come and tell them. We have to back it with action. The Ambazonia and Cameroon war is still ongoing. What led to the Ambazonia and Cameroon war? The same diversity, ethnic differences. Do you know how the European has been able to solve this war, prevent this war from happening in Europe? Because they discovered that during the time when they were trying to manage their diversity, this, this progress stopped in Europe. They witnessed conflict, they witnessed crisis, tribal wars in Europe, and they came back to research in, in, in each conflict in Europe. After they tried to solve the conflict, they went into research. Why did this conflict happen? They discovered that because of intolerance, because of the tribal intolerance in Europe, that led to so many conflict, including having terrorist organization in the United Kingdom. Now, what did the European Union and what did the Europeans did? They decided to divide along tribal line without wars. For common interest, for the progressive of European Union, each country, each tribe that won their own country, they give them and let the peace reign. Today, Europe is controlling Africa. They don't want you, Africa, to divide along a tribal line like them. They don't want you to be progressive and innovative like them. Because they want you to continue to kill each other, put you all in one place. Different tribe, different religion, different everything in one place and to, for you to fight and kill each other. You will be conducting election from year to year, killing each other, assassinating each other without progress. You can never solve corruption in Africa because of the current status, because of the current structure of Africa. Africa needs to be disintegrated for us to form a very formidable and powerful unit, unity in Africa. What I am telling you today is something that is globally obtainable. We have not seen anywhere in the world where diversity was strength of any nation. That nation can never see progress. Because if you bring something to talk about that will bring forward or bring or move any nation forward, other ethnic group will suppress it because they are going to suppress it as ethnically motivated. So I'm going to rest my, my case here. Thank you, uh, Dr. Matanga, for having me. I rest my case here. I want everybody to think and meditate on what I have just presented here today. Diversity must be disintegrated in Africa. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you much, very much, Simon. Good things come and go, but they remain in our blood. As you walk home, as you fly home, one of the things that has caught our eyes is indeed your room is well guarded. <laughs> Professor Piero was trying to say it was after these COVID restrictions, he was going to fly to see you. <laughs> but the prof, <coughs> prof has just written a note to me in the conference <laughs> to say, ask our brother, what is this on the wall under the one near? <laughs> the one that is just near the stool there. Which one? I don't, yeah, there are so many of those things there. <laughs> that is the real Africa. The real Africa. We are not. We are. We are, we are not hiding our culture. We are very proud of our culture, and that's exactly why they should listen to us. Look at the way Professor Lumumba dressed to this conference today. He is dressed in Igbo attire. That is Isiago. 
What is he wearing is Biafra attire. And I'm very happy to see him dressed like that. Is he aware that what he's dressing is an Igbo attire? Is a Biafra attire? My, my name is which one? Yours is, yours is, a, a, is a general African attire. That's why I mentioned your name. This is, this yes. is Africa. But the professor is very scared about those things. <laughs> Tell him not to be scared. <laughs> Tell him not to be scared. He should be. <laughs> no, he's scared. He... <laughs> he should be tell professor tell pro professor to be more scared of the of the drawings and the picture on, on his own cloth because that is the picture of a very powerful wild wild uh, beast. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. He says it's okay. Recording stopped. He says it is okay. And that he's going to come to see you once the restrictions are over. Yes. You are going to be talking a lot with Professor. <laughs> He's a very good constitutional lawyer. Africa must always engage his service. Recording in progress. To see that things go well. But I told you, Professor, you are also a soldier, a military soldier. Yes. So when you if you it comes to your house, you should be very careful. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I told him you have to be prepared for Buhari because Buhari usually jumps on people. That's why you are putting that thing near the stool. Ready. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I guess Buhari. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have two guests. Another guest coming in right now is none other than Professor. Professor PLO Mumba will almost wind up the thing for us and send us to our blankets and we go for us who are near. Then we shall have, we are still trying to connect line number 288. I don't know. You know, that is Maputo. I have tried and I think, I don't know, he came on, on and then off. If he comes out or his PA, we are going to, as Professor talks. Professor Piero, so many things have been said by Simon. We have looked at the security of Africa. This conference has taught me lots of things especially from the young lady from uh, Sudan, and then the Madame Anne, who told me, us about it. Then Mahapira, the ladies today seem to have come well positioned to give us. And then Nachama rescued us men and brought serious points. Then Chinedu, Mr. Chinedu, you remember? He asked us to be, he has watched me for many years. He asked us to take these messages to Africa delivers. So, sir, Professor Piero, remember you are welcome to take us home. Come, come, come. Don't spray yourself today. <laughs> Thank you very much, David. Uh, thank you very much, uh, all the good men and women who have made very wonderful contributions. As we grapple with issues that are very important to the continent of Africa, we all agree is that Africa faces existential threats. And already we have given accounts in different countries which face threats. It is therefore not wise to repeat that uh, the conflicts which we see in Ethiopia, in Nigeria, in the Democratic Republic of Congo undermine the unity of Africa. One of the things that we want to grapple with here is what it is we can do to eliminate 
those conflicts. While I understand my very good friend from Biafra, I will disagree with him to a certain extent. It is not always true that diversity must lead to disunity. What Julius Kambarage Nyerere did within 24 years in Tanzania of creating a nation of different nations with over 136 ethnicities is a testament to the fact that leadership and understanding of the interests of communities, if properly harnessed, can create unity in diversity. The problem in most African countries are leaders who are myopic and therefore mobilize populations on the basis of short-term political interests and use ethnicity as cannon fodder. I invite you to listen to one of the early speeches of Obafemi Awolowo when Nigeria still had three regions. And Obafemi said at that time, we in the West will defend Nigeria as long as the Nigerian administration recognizes that Nigeria is an artificial country which we are trying to build and to nurture. Nigeria failed to listen to the idea that a federal structure must be made attractive to everybody and the center must make sense. You will also remember uh, the meeting in Aburi in Ghana, and I know we have had occasion to talk about Aburi. But if you listen to Chuku Emeka Odumegu Ojuku after Aburi, he took the view that if the interests of the different components of Nigeria were taken care of, so that the center remained with defense and foreign affairs and people are allowed to self-determine, then Nigeria could be protected. And you remember the very famous words of Chukwemeka Odumegu Ojuku by Aburi we stand and the response of Yakubu go on and by Aburi shall fall. And it is on that basis that the civil war was prosecuted. So I want to submit to you that diversity in and of itself is not a problem. The problem are politicians who use negative ethnicity as a basis of mobilization and therefore weaponize their ethnicities for their short-term political interests. We see that now in Ethiopia, we have seen that in Sudan. And I remember so very vividly the words of John Garang de Mabior when he was fighting for the self-determination of the people of South Sudan. He told Omar al-Bashir, make unity attractive and we shall not leave Khartoum. If you make Khartoum attractive to us, but if you want to use the power of Khartoum, to Islamize and to Arabize us, then we shall move away. It is the same argument that was put to Gama, to Jafar Numeri in the 1960s on the same Sudan question. And once again, I want to submit to you that the problem is not diversity in and of itself. I will also take you to 1961 during the Katanga War, Patrice Emery Lumumba, who came from one of the smallest nations, the Batetela, was able to galvanize the attention of most of the Congolese. And it was the negative ethnic, ethnic mobilization of Moise Chombe that ultimately led to the problems in the Democratic Republic of Congo. 
I am submitting, therefore, that we should not always say that diversity is the problem. It is a problem of leadership. In Europe, it is also not true that there is not a single country that is not diverse and is thriving. There is. You will remember that Switzerland was at war for very many years. The Swiss then agreed that we have a German population, we have an Italian population, we have a French population, we have a Roman population, and Switzerland remains one of the most stable countries because the center in Bern is very weak, it is a confederal structure, and the presidency is rotational. Once again, I'm suggesting to you that our problem is selfish politicians who weaponize ethnicities for short-term political interests. That said and done, my view is that there is a problem in Africa, and I agree with you. There is a problem which must be resolved. Africa and Africans must now take a solemn vow that the only way to solve their problems is to reason together. In Nigeria, and I can't agree with you more, Africa must not allow Nigeria to collapse in a disorderly manner. I look forward to the day when the central administration in the Federal Republic of Nigeria shall convene a meeting of all Nigerians and renegotiate Nigeria. And if people want to leave Nigeria, that they may become a stronger part of it, so be it. But we cannot afford to hide our heads like the ostrich in the sun. Otherwise, the countries will be destroyed. The same must apply in Ethiopia. In a nutshell, without repeating myself, what I want to say is this. Africans must now resolve their problems. We know, and some young man, I think it is Chinedu who said it, that Chinua Achebe says in his book, Things Fall Apart, that when two brothers fight to death, it is a stranger who inherits their land. As long as Africans are fighting, as long as Africans are not solving their problems, it is the vultures from Europe, it is the vultures from India, it is the vultures from China, and I'm using the word vulture as a figure of speech who will come and eat the carcass of the continent of Africa to the detriment of the people of Africa. We can no longer give colonization as an excuse. We ought to rise up and begin to resolve our problems and to strengthen African institutions. And indeed, this can only be realized if both leadership and followership begin to change. A good professor who said that we must have something in the nature of a Pauline Convention and say the things I used to love, I love them no more. African leaders love corruption. African leaders love indiscipline. African leaders love negative, negative ethnicity. African leaders engage in activities which are inimical to the unity of the continent. They must now hate those things and love the things that they hated. They hated ethical behavior. They hated discipline. They hated all the negative things. It is time to love those things if Africa is to thrive. And it is our duty to keep on shouting, even if our voices are not being heard at their most eloquent. It must be done. It will be done. And if it is not done in this generation, our voices must remain alive so that Africa can realize our potential. I have no doubt in my mind that conferences and the engagements such as these are important for the long-term health of Africa. It cannot be that a continent that is so rich is always at the lowest rung of human development. It cannot be correct that a continent that is so endowed with both natural and human resources is always the continent that is made to consume the dregs and the remnants that other civilizations have abandoned. You see it now with COVID-19, 
the vaccines that the Americans have rejected, the vaccines that the Europeans have rejected, the vaccines that the Russians have rejected, the vaccines that the Chinese have rejected are the very same that are being sent to the continent of Africa and we are consuming them unquestioningly and gleefully as if we were children of a lesser God. It is not right that while other civilizations are sitting on the dinner table, we are at the bottom of the table waiting for crumbs to fall. And when the crumbs fall, we celebrate and shout, shout Eureka. It is not right. And it is our duty to ensure that we play our part in this regard. Thank you very much. And I look forward to the results of these deliberations being forwarded to all heads of states and government in the continent of Africa. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, all of you. I can see the hand of uh, your son. When elders have spoken in Africa, usually sons don't come back. An argument. I don't. I, <laughs> Yes, I don't know what Simon wants to say. What is it, Simon? Just two minutes, two minutes. No, not two minutes, <laughs> one. <laughs> two minutes. I wanted to I wanted to make a comment on Switzerland, only Switzerland, nothing else. Go ahead. All right. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Matsanga, for giving me the opportunity again. You are always one of the best, I can say. Without you, I wonder what we'll be doing in Africa because you are you have become an eye opener and you take our Africa course upon yourself. Uh, I agree uh, with uh, my my uh, professor uh, Lumumba, but also I would want to make it very very clear that there is no country in Europe that is very developed and progressing today with the diversity. The Switzerland the professor mentioned is a, was a non-EU uh, country. Switzerland became <clears throat> part of EU just in 2004. Yeah, Schengen State in 2004, and they started implementing. <laughs> they started implementing the uh, the implementation of the uh, the agreement in 2008. <laughs> so, Switzerland <laughs> is also a landlocked country that has French. German, Italian, and Romansh as language. Now, what should interest our professor is that Switzerland is just example of European Union. European Union disintegrated along ethnic line, along tribal line, and at the end of the day, they selected few countries that, that they have something in common, that they have some kind of common value system to form what we call European Union. And that is the reason why European Union is very strong, because there are countries, different countries with common cultural value system. So in Switzerland, Switzerland is a landlocked country that is just a replica of the European Union. It cannot, it cannot be equated to a country with diversity. I disagree with that, because Switzerland today is the only country in Europe that you see people going there to bank their stolen money and corruption money. And they will bank that money safely because of the stringent, stringent uh, system and policy of the Switzerland. That is not acceptable in other European countries. They have strict financial laws than the Switzerland. So Switzerland is just a, 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 a replica of what European Union represents. Which people do you have there? You have German, you have Italian, you have French, you have Roman. All these four languages comprise the European, the, you, you, are, you are found in the European Union. But Russia is in Europe. Is Russia part of European Union? 
Is Russia part of Schengen state? The answer is no. But Switzerland is part of Schengen state, which means they share same value system. So this alone has actually uh, solved the issue of diversity because you practice, the same thing you practice in Switzerland is the same thing obtainable in the European Union and in Schengen, free Schengen state. So I have some slight disagreement with this, using Switzerland as example of a, diversi a diversified or a diversity in a state. I want you to tell me about Russia. Tell me how Russia is a good example of diversity because Russia today have diversity. I want you to use Russia as example. And let us see how the economy of Russia and whether there are people that are not living below $1 in Russia today. So these are the countries that you should be, you should be telling us how the diversity has able to help the people okay. and the citizens of those countries. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much. Conference. The world, Africa. Those who have been watching, those who have taken part, we tried to get into contact. We got into contact sometime this morning with President Chisano. He was supposed to speak, but it looks like he's an elderly statesman. So he hasn't, with the communication barriers that we see, he did not turn up, but he promised that he will be with us next time. I want to take this opportunity, therefore, to thank all of you, to thank the management, to thank all my staff, to thank all of you participants who have been able to take part, to thank those who have been in touch with us, to thank Michelle for the behind the scenes contribution for the work you have done behind the scenes, to thank all of you who have taken part, who have taken your time, studied worked on this topic. There are many topics still coming. We promise you it is not the end. We shall be big until we come to a final African position. Already so many countries have taken over our initiative, promised to be part and a parcel of our discussions. And the professor, I assure you, the next conference, Hamid, Hamid, Hamida is in Khartoum. I am very impressed with the leadership in Khartoum when they watched some of my clips. Some of them have said, I better hold one in Khartoum. And another country says, no, it has to be Harare. Another country says, it has to be a Russia International Conference Center. So, with the doctor, we are going to check and see where we can hold our final conference. But there are two things, Simon. The Bible says whether you are one or two, as long as or three. In fact, the Bible talks about the three people. What matters is not where you are seated, but what you are talking about, as long as it is in God's name. I know Professor reads the Bible every Sunday, it's Anglican like him. So let him know it. There are so many ways of entering the kingdom of God. Is there any? The people enter there as Hindus, Muslims, Buddhists, Anglicans, Catholics, even the pagans. 
Do you know that the pagan is also God? Because none of us have separated. When you are burying a pagan and a Christian, do you, you, you tell where he's going? There is only one thing on earth. Whether you have titles like a Buhari generals, when you are thrown in, apparently, I, I like the way the Muslims bury, they just bury you in no more sand. Like uh, Mr. Buhari will be thrown in no more sand in his running up there. No big, we Christians are the ones who bring this tomb, big tomb of where you can even take your car down, you know. You can't drive that car downstairs there. I've seen some people in Nigeria with a car buried with him. Are we no more Africans? Look at the type of Africans. South Africans, professors I end. Did you know that most of the South Africans sleep in their cars during holiday? Did you know? You better know. I've done a research. I don't have a name. You see the gap? Honestly, Africa. What that lady and the other lady from Khartoum? And, and Amida. What did they talk about the pain? When it is a holiday in South Africa, people sleep in cars and celebrate. They carry kind of tents and raise them somewhere. Where at times they are chased away from the farms. Not to put there. They are like a gypsies. Have you seen gypsies in Europe? They come and they invade your, your, your cotton, your farm, and put there their cars by force. So when you see South Africans looting shops, which they have started going back to buy things from ShopRite, is a mindset. But who caused the mindset? Mandela. Luckily enough, professor is here who went to, to Barry. And the professor cried the tears. For me, I never cried a tear for Mandela. I saw him cry tears when Mandela died. Me, I cried tears when Mugabe died. Yes. When Mugabe died, I cried tears. And I, I went, I made sure I go up to Harare. I went up to Harare to see his final send off. I'm proud because Mugabe left some legacy. He left something. Can you reverse the land process in Zimbabwe? No. Even Chamisa has farms. Chamisa is exporting flowers to send by the Tesco in Finland. Mandela left us with poems, which the professor recites every day. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry, professor is here. Me and the professor will joke. I will give him time. I have to leave the time. Doctor Matanga, I have to interject on that one as a woman. I cannot allow you to 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 to, to laugh about that. I'm interjecting on that one and taking that one and saying you are. No one was something else. I am going to give you time, mom. But I'm saying the truth. Mandela left us with poems. That's why people break mindset. This lady unsafe. The mindset of Africans is breaking your own shop and burning your own bus that you are going to use tomorrow. Makapira tell me in Britain who burns his own church. You live in Britain. You come from Kitale. People in Kitale break into houses and oh. burn people's property because of an election. Mandela left us with poems. We are still singing the poems. 
But Mugabe left us with land. Let's go for the vote and you'll see how I'll defeat you. Is Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe, look at the roads Zimbabwe is building now. Very soon Zimbabwe will come back, give it 10 years. It is competing. But poem, 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 poem. Prof, poem. And then I said this, and then I said this. So I just want to give Makapila one minute to answer me. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Matsuanga. But um, as we were listening to Dr. Joseph um, uh, Nyachai, uh, we have to remember that all great leaders have had a journey. And I will say that leadership comes with greatness. So, sorry, I don't know what happened there, but uh, my reception. But I will answer you by saying that I hear where you're coming from, but um, I think that I will submit by asking Africans to enhance good leadership, but understand that the legendary that you're talking about is something worth thinking about. So I will answer you diplomatically like that. And I think that um, both leaders were quite great in their own sense um, of being and a sense of belongingness that brought the world into some kind of thinking. But having said that, can we not forget um, the legend as well who was Winnie Mandela? And I love the freedom um, that um, the, the freedom um, of social justice because without the women, um, then I don't think we would have had about Mandela. So I'll leave it that and I submit to you that I will not, I will leave this for you to you as a PLO uh, professor. Uh, but it is interesting to see how those changing patterns happen. But you're absolutely right. We need to be um, the change makers of the world. We need to allow our youth to learn from the best. And I also want to address quickly um, Simon the issue of the diversity and inclusion there, because I don't want diversity much of being confused with inclusion, and I think they're both right in their own remit. Um, Simon is talking about um, inclusion, and the P uh, PLO is talking about diversity. We need to embrace our identity, we need to em embrace who we are, we need to love Africa. I submit back to you, I, Dr. Matsanga. Well, should I talk? I'm not responding. I, she's my student. The teacher <laughs> responds to the student. The teacher responding to the student is like a, a, you know, a teeth going to, to, to stick on a fish. It's very difficult to find a tick ticking on a fish. Have you ever seen one? No. So I love Magapira. She used to challenge me so much. But she learned out of me. Prof, I was not doing it in a bad way. But the truth is that South Africans, some of them were saying on their placard that Mandela left us with poems. It's not me. While people were on the white man's land, South Africans spent their Christmas in BMWs. Yes. Have you seen the traffic between Johannesburg and Durban? The whole road up to Johannesburg is full, no movement, because they don't have anywhere to go. They are in South Africa, but they are not South Africa. Is that the Africa you want? My last point, before I call in a man who will remove a vote of funds to the guests, then we go. Prof, we need to think seriously about this topic. Does Africa need the elections? I am not convinced. As I leave this hall, that even in Kenya, where you are, this Kenya of yours, you need elections. You don't know anything about elections. 
You only know how to sharpen the pangas. We kill people. You are now sharpening the pangas. One year before the election, you are looking for guns. You are bringing in terrorists. You are bringing in so many things because of elections. You need elections in Africa. Surely, China, I ask the people in the morning, show me one MP from China, member of parliament of China. Wing, wang, wang, yeah, 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 wang, wang, yeah, yeah. Show me one. Nobody African has shown. I told you to wish to recite to where you saw one member of parliament. Nobody has answered back for most. But China is lending us money. And it's about to take some of our ports. <laughs> some of the towns are being taken in, in, in Colombo. In Zambia is about to go. You can see the problem we have. It hasn't got MPs. Here the MPs eat more money than the people who voted them. That's why there's a sharp rise in violence. Someone wants to become a president because he wants to eat, not to serve us. Buhari became a president, promised us to solve Boko Haram 100 days. Now it is eight years. Boko Haram is still cutting people's hands. There you are. I want to take this opportunity to thank you all. All of you. All of you. I want to dedicate this lecture today. Since Mahapira is here, to my great friend Benazir Bhutto, Madame Bhutto, rest in peace, Mama. Mahapira, you were a student in London Guild Hall. You remember Calicutta House, where I and Benazir Bhutto were studying, and she was lecturing and studying a master's, a PhD. She won the said. <laughs> what is happening? Is this? Is there somebody who wants to speak? Okay. Benazir Bhutto said, when democracy returns to Pakistan, the first person to have as my PA, who would not be a Muslim, but and not a Pakistani, will be you. And she told me, I thought I would be one of those in her office. And unfortunately, Musharif killed her. And nobody, can it, can it puzzle you again that Musharif is still very alive? <laughs> nobody has looked for him because he did a job on behalf of by selling Osama bin Laden to Americans. Americans kept off. They didn't pursue. So two days ago, I was in charge, in, in touch with Benazir Bhutto's son. Because he, he, he used to come to the car. The, the driver used to come with them to the car that remembers me. I introduced and send my photograph. So the rest is his prof. You will see. I remember the words of that lady. I would have become the first PA in Pakistan. I don't know how I would look like, but here I am. We lost a great leader. But he, she told me never to give up in life because she had been a prime minister before and taken out, tried to be put in jail to be killed like the father was. She told me, don't give up. 
I have not given up fighting for Africa. That's all I wanted to say. With those few words, and the many words since morning, I want to call upon Tawish, who is somewhere on the coast, not in, to make a vote of facts. Sorry, a vote of facts. Tawish, summon in two minutes. That's it. And uh, after that, I will lead the prayer. And then we close. Oh, very well. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. David Nyakola Chamasanga, who is the founder and chairperson of Pipeline Africa TV and the convener of this particular conference uh, by Pan African Forum Limited. Indeed, it's been a very successful conference, I must say. Uh, not just because of the contribution that the participants and, of course, the panelists have made today, uh, but because of the immense contributions they have uh, put forth in as far as what we can do as a continent so that uh, at least we can have a change, a continent that we, uh, we all desire and aspire as a people. I also want to take this opportunity most sincerely, of course, to thank uh, Professor Pielo Lumumba, uh, Dr. Joseph Nyanchama, and, of course, uh, Simon Kipa, and so many of the other panelists, I may not necessarily mention each of your names, but of course we acknowledge uh, the contribution and its participation that we have had uh, today. Indeed, it has been a very candid discussion uh, right from, the, uh, from morning up to this particular time. Uh, the kind of suggestions, the kind of observations we have made, uh, and the kind of, of course, uh, the contribution that you have made is going to go a long way in not only shaping uh, the, today's uh, lives, but it's also going to uh, shape uh, the future of Africa, and more so on the young generation and also the leadership of the continent of Africa. This is the kind of discussions, this is the kind of conversation that we want to engage on moving forward, uh, because again, uh, the zeal and commitment to want to bring a change in the continent of Africa cannot be left to outsiders. It cannot be left to any other person if it is not us taking it by ourselves. And I think we have begun it. This is not just about to stop. In any case, it is gaining momentum. We'll be having such kind of conferences time and again uh, so that we can continually inspire uh, our young people and the entire uh, populace of the African continent really to focus so much on what individually we can do. And when we do it individually, then collectively, of course, we'll be achieving the ultimate objective. Uh, that is the dream of Africa. I want to thank each of you and more sincerely, uh, Dr. David Masanga, yourself, of course, for uh, making it a success and uh, seeing it fit, really, uh, to convene such a very important uh, conference and forum uh, where all Africans really can engage freely uh, without uh, any kind of uh, caveats. And this is uh, what we need moving forward. At this particular time, I want to wish you all the best and hope that we'll have yet another opportunity to engage like we have done today uh, so that together we can move our continent of Africa forward. Uh, thank you so much. For now, I hand you back to Dr. David Masanga. Thank you very much. I want to take this opportunity before I call upon everybody to close his or her eyes to thank Michelle. Michelle, thank you very much for everything you have done to make this conference a success. Thank you for your courageous efforts that you have put in to make, to call most of the delegates from the 54 countries, I want to give you special thanks. Thank you very much, Michelle, and God bless you. I also want to say thank you very much, Prof, for honoring, and uh, all of you, Simon, Dr. Nachama, Juliet, Dr. Hamida, and the rest of you all. David, Kosowe, all of the people from Uganda, from where, from Togo, from Kain, wherever you came, and Dr. Oriem of the Ugandan Ministry, who kept of foreign affairs. Thank you very much. You have shown interest in what we talk. And we have talked our sense. We haven't attacked anybody's country. Thank you. Let's 
pray. God, we want to thank you at this hour for having given us the spirit, the strength to be able to conduct this meeting from morning up to now. As people live to go to various homes in their various countries, we pray that God gives them guidance, just as he has given us guidance today to conclude this conference. As we get organized for the sake of Africa, just remember those who have perished, who continue to perish, who continue to languish in prisons without charges, and who continue to be killed, beaten, maimed, slaughtered, raped, defiled in all conflict zones of Africa. We pray God that you give us the strength, give African leaders the vision, the wisdom, the courage to see the to change from Saul to Paul as pre preached by one Dr. Nyachama. I remember the words of Kwame Nkrumah who said, I'm an African, not only African, but Africa is in me. Every time I walk, oh God, I think of what I can do. Even at lunch time, I was telling my good professor, what can we do to change this Africa? It needs a lot of strength. I thank you all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I should have been a man. I should have been at the altar, man. Attention, attention, IPOB One Family. This announcement is for those outside of the USA that wish to donate to the Eastern Security Network Fund that is based in the United States. Because of the fees that donators have to pay the bank when sending wires, we recommend that if you're sending less than $250, that you donate through the IPOB USA website. It's fast, simple, and less expensive for you. Go to our website, www.ipobinusa.org slash donate. That is www.ipobinusa.org slash donate and make your contribution. When it comes to keeping our people safe, every bit counts. After all, the security of our communities is our responsibility. Let's make this happen together. Thank <laughs> you. 
Anambara, Enugu, Delta. And even for your domoto, you must join this movement. This one no be ABC, PDP, Abga, no Munea, Wemego. No, 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 no. This one now. Everybody must join hand. This message is from the indigenous people of Biafra, IPOB, under the leadership and command of Onendu Maze Namde. Different name, me and one menu observe ghost town, ghost cities, ghost markets, schools, offices, no money and ele, a jocola messe, in here cage with Rani, Macanone, Literato, Mebonaga, Tinanon, no Quacanuku, Mulo Chara, Chitapano, now Quad Hariala, no son in Abba, Abuko, some way in Abba, Yejitaraka, or Nechi, Dinta Nechi, Operation Monday's Ghost Town, now let your friend in a banaga game. In the Kapati campaign, election, meeting, mobi hende iria na la biafra. Ndi o chichinile, ndi ese, ndi youth leader, ndi PG, market chairman, banks, road transport workers, town union heads, no se kwa no se ya. Gadoro kwa kanantu, makana onye ne fugo nti, aba fuo yante, onye se nangu adege ire. Ye ure ni atanye nanya, makana ekbe bo mwala. A prayer girl for man, Biafra Bio Kemba. No wonder Britain is the great Biafra. Onyele la ne nazo, mawani na de nazo. Onyele la ne nazo, mawani na de nazo. A B C D, all ga foka. On a battle roman, yamara. Ato kura no feke, ye fe B C no ya. Eji kula kaga patani he de bugu, no bochi ahu. Nina na bali tulu nkomwa satwa. I'm going to go to the next 